I have been empowered to coach this team mm -hmm. my way. And that means we run the system. Every play, every game, no deviation. Anyone who has a problem with that is gonna find a home next to me on the bench. I'm Rodney Barnes, executive producer on HBO's Winning Time. Welcome to the official podcast. You can't have the money, the power, and the love, Irvin. You're a basketball savant. But until you put your fucking heart into this thing, you have no idea if this is going to work. It ain't showtime no more. On today's episode, we check in with Jeff Perlman, whose book, Showtime, heavily informed our series. Next, we'll speak with composer Robert Glasper about creating the show's signature sound. To finish, we'll chat with hair designer Sana Sepinen about the do's adorning this season's characters. But first, a little recap. This episode, titled The New World, was directed by Tanya Hamilton. In it, we see Coach Westhead's fragile control of the team fall apart when Magic refuses to comply with the system. To make matters worse, when the team finds out about Magic's $25 million contract, they start the season more divided than ever. The conflict with Westhead gets so tense that Riley starts wearing a neck brace and Magic demands to be traded. Ooh, what's gonna happen next? A quick note, some of these scenes and moments and instances are fictional. We add them in to tie facts together and to weave a narrative that is compelling. Again, some things are fictional, but they're inspired by true events. Let's dive on in. As always, our first guest is the phenomenal, incredibly talented, handsome Jeff Perlman the author of the book that inspired this series. Jeff, it's great to have you here again. To quote the great Vanilla Ice, I'm here to wax a chump like a candle. <laughs> I think you lost four demerits, <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, I'm going to let it go. Thank you. On topic, mm -hmm. a Sports Illustrated article. And that article that had the classroom photo with Coach Westhead and the players sitting around the room like students... Can you give us any insight as to what the truth is behind this photo, how everybody felt? Just any insight and tidbits. Sure. So at the time, Sports Illustrated was the mecca of sports coverage in America. And if Sports Illustrated came and said, we want to do a feature on you or we want to do a photo shoot or whatever, it was an enormous, enormous deal. This is pre-social media. And really, Sports mm -hmm. Illustrated dominated the landscape. So Sports Illustrated's photographer actually presented the Lakers with this idea we're doing this whole theme about back to school with the NBA, and we want to take a picture of Paul Westhead as an instructor in front of the class with the Lakers as students. You know, I worked at SI. We had some weird... <laughs> I wasn't there at that point. But we had some weird stuff at SI. And, you know, it was like a concept kind of magazine. Yeah, I get it. Right. I get it. So that was the idea. Yeah. The photographer shows up, and he explains the idea, and they're all into the idea. But the players hate it. Of course. Right, they hate it. For multiple, I hate reasons. it for them right now. I do too, actually. It hurts my head. <laughs> the idea of this, and like, it wasn't like a bunch of rookies. Like, oh, you can make the argument, rookies coming to school, their first NBA training right. camp. This was like Magic, yeah. Norm, Kareem, Kareem. I mean, they all could have been teaching Paul West said <laughs> exactly. about the NBA. Life. Exactly. So it was really disastrous, and West had dug it, and the players hated it. Of course, it. he did. And if you look, actually, Kareem didn't show up with the right shoes, so they kind of had to hide his feet. He wasn't into this at all, <laughs> but they did it. And the thing was a catastrophe because it came out and it made them look stupid. And it, also, like, there's the whole thing that now we see in Hollywood, and I think people are more aware of now, which is this power structure of, oh, the white guy is exactly. showing us all how to yes, do this. And exactly. thank God for him, the savior, the white and savior. And the guy that never really played the game right. at that level is going to teach the guys right. who already play the game at that level. Right. And I... Paul Westhead was no dummy. Like, Paul Westhead no, was a no, smart exactly, basketball mind, exactly. the whole thing. Yes, yes, but yes. Kareem Magic, Norm, I mean, exactly. it's, rid it's ridiculous. Let's talk a little Kurt Rambis, mm -hmm. who is, I guess, in the annals of Laker lore, is an unusual character. You know, he came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Santa um, Clara. Can you talk about Kurt a little bit? There are a lot of things about Rambis that are interesting. First of all, Rambis in college was a 20-point-per-game scorer. He could fill it up. Well, he goes to camp with the Knicks as a rookie, sticks with the Knicks for a little bit, and then he's basically picked off the trash heap by the Lakers. Right. And Jerry West has really 
very little interest in Kurt Rambis because you watch him play and he is clunky. He's just off. He's kind of robotic at that point. As soon as West said, finds out that West is a no on him, because at this point there was a start of the power dynamic fight. Was it really that simple? Is it really that if this guy doesn't want to do it, then I'm going to do it to spite that guy? I mean, to a certain degree, yes. Wow. My favorite story about Kurt Rambis is he used to bring a bag, like a big duffel bag, yeah. into the Lakers locker room and steal sodas and right. all the different supplies and bring them home. Magic's 25-year, $25 million contract. Can you give us any insight into um, this deal? Jerry Buss was the first owner, I would say, in the NBA who actually viewed players to a certain degree as partners. Mm. A lot of these guys were old racist white men who viewed their players as property, almost like they belonged to me in a weird, gross, yeah, patriotic yeah, 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 way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jerry Buss was the first guy who was like, this is kind of a partnership. And with the $25 million, obviously at some point there was going to be a renegotiation, and Jerry Buss was aware of this. It wasn't like 20 years from now, mm -hmm. or, you know, 10 years from now, you're still going to be making the $1 million. Obviously, salary scales change. He saw it as... I am making a commitment to you that we are in this together for the long run. And this is, I believe in you, and I'm giving you this money. I mean, it was a lot of money for the time. Yeah, big time. And if you hear, and you come from Lansing, Michigan, and you hear $25 million right. in 25 years, that's security, and it's a significant amount of money. Correct. And the other thing you have to remember at this point is Magic was making really good side money off of endorsements. It's the first real Laker right. where the sports contract was almost a supplemental to what you were making in endorsements as opposed to the other way around. So this caused a lot of dissension within the team because you're thinking about, okay, this guy's got a guarantee that we don't have. Not just the money, but the idea of 25 years, they've made a commitment to him that none of us, including Kareem, actually have. Yeah. And so we want to keep it a secret for as long as possible. Somebody leaked it. Can you speak to who? It might have been someone whose name arrived with Schnorm Schnickson. <laughs> <laughs> no, Norm Nixon was pissed. Yes. I get it. The amount of money he's making compared to the amount of money Norm was making, that's a freaking ego blow. Yeah. So when you find this out and you're like, Norm is a talker, Norm is a go to guy for the media, all of a sudden it gets out real quick. Let's talk about the locker room. What type of dissension, the specifics? Well, okay. The biggest problem, by far, hands down, and this has happened through the years with athletes, is you become known as the owner's pet. Yeah. And that causes a lot of problem because mm -hmm. then they assume you're involved with personnel decisions. Yep. They assume he has your ear. And then anytime anything happens, they'll say, oh, you're going to go talk to your guy? You're going to go yep. talk to your guy? You just become known as the pet of the owner. Exactly. And that gets really freaking ugly. And once you're called the owner's boy enough times exactly. by your fellow black yeah. teammates, yeah, 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 yeah. it gets really uncomfortable. The thing about Magic also, like, Magic is a confusing character. He's not the smiling magic, the laughing magic, the yes. seven up commercial magic, yes. the magic patting little Timmy, the white kid outside yeah, the forum yeah, in the yeah, head. Yeah, yeah. Like magic is a pretty tough kid from Michigan. And on the court, he was a badass. Like Larry Bird was no greater of a competitor than Magic Johnson. They were both right. hard nosed, would slit your throat, whole thing. But magic had this image. And after a while, people just think you're full of crap. Right. And, you know, because Kareem, say what you want about Kareem. There was oh, he no, was who he was. He was yeah. who he was. Yeah. Even Norm was who he was. Yeah. He was a flashy yeah, guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Magic, there was this sense, and there still is a sense in the world, that he's this one guy over here and this other guy here. Yes. Moving on to the Magic Westhead tension. Yeah. Which you could kind of see brewing. You know, you're coming off this place where you had a coach who almost built an offense with McKinney to highlight everything that you do well. Mm -hmm. And now you're sort of in a situation where you're dealing with a coach who has created an offense that stagnates all of that. Do you think that was the birth of the tension, or do you think it started before that? No, I think that was the emphasis of it. Paul Westhead wasn't an unlikable guy. He's always been a likable guy. You won't find players who are like, he's a jerk. Right. Never. Literally... Spencer Hayward tried to have him killed, and when I interviewed Spencer Hayward, he's like, look, he was always a nice guy. It has nothing to do with it. It was just the circumstance. Right. <laughs> I was high. I needed him yeah, dead. But it was it's not... high. I, was, I didn't know. I liked the guy, but then I wanted to kill him too. So um, it wasn't about personality. It was about this guy screwing up what we have going and, like, right. this idea of, like, everyone's going to go to this spot, and I'm going to go to this spot, Magic, you're going to go to this spot, and you go to this spot, and we're going to pass the ball. It was so high school. Right. And Magic had a style that was dependent upon improvisation to a degree. 
because he played, his style was so um, loose and free-flowing and exciting that if you build a personality or the idea of a personality and put those two together, you've got a character that you can market. Yep. And now you've got a coach that's taking a part of that away. I would agree with that. So I would be mad too. Can you give us some insight to the story with Magic refusing to get on the bus? Yeah, well, he was fed up. And he's basically like, to hell with this. They're at the airport. And he wouldn't acknowledge Paul West on the bus. It's almost the beginning of the end Oh, of the relationship. By the time you get to the point where he's just out in the open and I could care less if everybody sees it or not. Yeah. Because it feels like there's that first act where, okay, I don't like this, but let's see what happens and blah, blah, blah. And now we're in it to where it's the beginning of the end. It's just so interesting because it was an era when coaches still were more powerful than players. Like nowadays, if LeBron said tomorrow, I don't want Darvin Ham as a coach. Oh, Darvin Ham would Darvin be, Ham's gone. Oh, if Jalen Brown comes back tomorrow. Right, now right. Working. Yeah. across the board. Every yeah. NBA team has one player who can get, at least one player who can get the coach fired yeah. ASAP. Yeah. That wasn't the case back then. The coaches were the power players, right? And if... Even Kareem if, couldn't have gotten rid no, of Jack McKay? Really? No, not at that point. Dr. J, Billy Cunningham, those types of things? Really? No, the power dynamic wasn't there yet. The coaches wow. held the power. And also, you have to remember, it was a white power structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah, yeah. almost all the coaches were white, and the players were pieces. I, I get that part, but you still want to win. Yes. And those guys that were great were rare. I know, but I'm telling you, most of these owners value the coaches more than the players. Wow. They just did. Okay. It's changed now. It's a 180 yeah, from what yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. So no, for Magic to have the confidence to say it's either him or me, and he gets off the bus at the airport, and Michael Cooper comes out, and he's like, "What's what are you doing? And he's like, I can't do this. The joy is gone. I hate this. And he, he really says, I want to be traded to the Pistons. Yeah. I talk a lot about how this is not that far away from the civil rights movement. And so the sensibilities of a white boss in confronting him and potentially losing all of this money and status and celebrity and all of these things because of a playing style, you know, it's unheard of. It's interesting you say that. that this is literally about 14 years after the assassination of Martin Luther King. Oh, yeah. It is not a no, big gap. exactly. Yeah. Our last aspect of Paul Westhead, I'm sure we'll talk about him again, but he has this quote, of the almond bears, it's fruit in silence. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. I don't think prior to or since a coach has made a statement such as that to kind anything of, to do with the game of basketball. It's or kind of impressive. Team. It is, yeah. big time. Can you talk about the quote a little bit? I think the main thing about Paul Westhead is, and to his credit, actually, he wasn't going to slam his players in public. Like, he never went to the media with his complaints about this. He never went to the media whining about Magic Johnson not playing. He never whined about any of his players. Jeff, thank you again. I can't tell you how much I love these conversations. Just being able to sit here with you and learn the insights and the insides of the world of basketball. And um, I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. So my next guest is a little different than most of the other guests that I've had on here. I want to introduce to the world the legendary... Grammy Award winner, Robert Glasper. Yay! Are y'all going to insert claps so I, so I sound like important? <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> My first question really comes down to how did you get involved with Winning Time? I got involved with Winning Time. I feel like it was you, Rodney. I feel like you kind of threw my name in the pot. I said we need him. I said, who was the blackest musician that we could find? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Robert Glasper. Absolutely. No, it was you, because I remember when I met you at Blue Note. So then, yeah, me and you were talking, and then I, like a few months later, I got the call, and it was super exciting, because I remember as a kid in the 80s, watching basketball with my dad, watching the Lakers and the Celtics. And I remember that so vividly. So when I got the call for this, I was like, oh, man, absolutely. And then when I heard Nick was the composer, I was all in because I'm a big fan of Nick Patel. You know, shout out to Nick, man. There was a rumor that you had aspirations to be a basketball player yourself at one time in life. I literally did. From elementary school through ninth grade, I was pretty athletic. You know, you think you're pretty good until you get to high school 
when you get to high school, that's when everything gets real. And uh, I auditioned for the high school for performing arts my freshman year of high school. And I got in, but I declined because I wanted to go to a regular high school so I could play basketball. That's how much I really loved it. And I realized once I rolled the bench all year, <laughs> that, <laughs> that that wasn't my gift. Yes. <laughs> and I tell people all the time, there's a difference between a hobby, your passion, and your gift. And luckily, I realized in ninth grade that my passion wasn't my gift. Once I just sat on the bench the whole year for basketball, I was like, okay, well, let me go ahead and go to the high school performing arts and really like hone in on this piano thing. And I was about 15. That's when I got really serious about the piano and, and, and it took off. You know what I mean? But I just, I'm so glad I realized that my passion wasn't my gift and I realized what my gift was early. Well, kudos to you because I held on way too long. I rode the bench <laughs> at high school, college. Every step along the way of my basketball career was really set it on the bench. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Is there a difference in telling a story with music? Because you are telling a story with a song. But when you're scoring something, how do you blend the score into what you see visually versus writing a song? So when you're writing a song, you know, you're trying to find the most beautiful things in the song. You're trying to layer it. You're trying to put all these different things in it to make it sound good. It's up to you. When I'm writing a song, it's kind of up to me what I'm doing and what story I'm trying to tell in this song I'm writing. When you're scoring something, it's not about a song. It's literally about what this scene needs at the time. And it could literally be one note. It could literally be a little string because sometimes the weight of the characters of and what they're saying and all the things could be you know, so much where you just need a little bit of, a little bit of music to kind of help tip it over. Are you sure you trust his knee? Yeah, you bet. <clears throat> yeah, he's getting sharper. He's, you know, he'll rise up ready when the moment comes. I had to learn that when scoring because I'll, I'll do something. I might feel like, oh, this is dope. This is beautiful what I just did. Oh, boom. And the director's like, no, not at all. You're <laughs> way off. It's an ego killer as well. And it really makes you really understand it's only about the feeling. It's not about the song. It's not about how good, the, you know, things sound. You know, sometimes you have to play things that don't necessarily sound good. But it, when you put the picture to it, it's amazing. This has nothing to do with anything that we're talking about right now, but... Is it as fun as you make it seem? You look like you have more fun than any musician in the history of life. Like, most musicians <laughs> look like they're in pain, and you just look like you have the time of your life. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to be your friend. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I love, man, I love what I do. I got to say, I'm, it's a blessing to be able to literally do for a living what it is I like to do and what it is I'm actually good at. And that's a blessing. But I also surround myself with people I want to work with, too. You know what I mean? Would you really have people you actually genuinely like to hang with and make music with, then it doesn't feel like work. It's like it becomes truly a party to come Literally. to your show to watch you do what you do. Literally. I try to keep that same energy when I'm in the studio. Because when you're in the studio, that's when things can change and cannot be fun because now there's so many aspects of this. It's not a live show. You're not getting, you know, it's not a crowd. You're not playing for the moment, you know, and, and it takes away a lot of times from the vibe of that you would normally be playing in. So I try to bring that same vibe to the studio as much as I can. That's why I'll tell some friends to stop by, hang out, might have a few drinks, you know, some wine or something like that. Yeah. Every time I did a winning time session, we put up a, a Nerf basketball goal <laughs> inside the studio. <laughs> and in between takes, we play basketball. <laughs> It kept it fun, too, when you were in the spirit of basketball. You know what I mean? Did Nick play? Did Nick play at all? Yeah, he was terrible. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> you have this eclectic array, like an array of talent that you partner with when mm. you do what you do. Where does that mm. come from? I've always loved to collaborate. I think that came from earlier on. My mother was a singer, and in the house, we used to always play duo. You know, I would play piano, she would sing. She sing, you know, so many different styles of music. So that's why, you know, on my Black Radio albums and in general, I love 
dealing with artists who have a, a spectrum yes. of different things they yes. like to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm always just searching for that and new sounds and different people that I haven't collaborated with. And this person can do more than one thing. So let's do this and this and this. And then when I got to New York in 97 for college, um, and that was during the time where the Roots were popular and the Roots were doing all these jam sessions in New York and in Philadelphia. And so I would go sit in with the Roots and I ended up being pretty much a root with them. I was in, in the band for a few years <laughs> and it just became a part of my life. You know what I mean? And just bringing people that were cool doing other things into the jazz world. You know what I mean? Yeah. All these people would come to the jazz club, uh, the Up Over Jazz Cafe. It's gone now. They never had a liquor license. It was very illegal. <laughs> yeah, that, but okay, okay. It was great for me, you know, and I would have all these great, amazing artists come in and just freestyle and they would do it over jazz. And, you know, and so it was, that was the community and that was what was happening at that time period, you know, so I kept it going, you know. Winning time is a period piece, late seventies into the early eighties. Was there music of that era that influenced you? Absolutely. Beyond the stuff that I begged you to try to put in the show? <laughs> <laughs> I love the 80s, bro. Like, my favorite record of all time is Off the Wall, 1970, ah, 78. Okay. That's my favorite record of all time. Matter of fact, Rod Temperton, yeah. Greg Fillingaines. Yeah. I was hanging out with Greg last night. Uncle okay. Greg. Okay. I feel like I was in third grade when I discovered the album, and I used to unfold it. Because you have to unfold yeah, it and you see yeah. Michael Jackson's. Yeah. And I used to sit there and listen to Off the Wall for hours. And I didn't know until later what that instrument was that I really gravitated to, but it was the Fender Rhodes, mm. an electric piano. And that's what Greg Fillingans is playing on that album. And I fell in love with that sound. You know what I mean? And then you go from there. It's Quincy Jones. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I was a yeah. big fan of The Wiz. I used to watch it over and over and over again. And I had all the Michael Jackson stuff. Michael Jackson was my my god. You know, my dad took me to the Victory Tour concert in 1985. I was seven years old. And I'll never forget it. That was my first concert ever. That's a good way to start. So in season one, you work with Nick Bertel, who scored Secession. Absolutely. Love Secession. Yes. I just finished it. How did you guys divide up work on Winning Time? So Nick basically had me do the live instrumental stuff, the stuff that was more on the funky side, more on the energy side, because it was scenes where people were playing basketball or right. blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? So I got my rhythm section, drummer, bass player, guitar, Two or three horns, something like that. I literally write on the spot. Yes. And Nick does it around the spot. He's a yep. cat. He has everything written out. He has charts, you know. <laughs> and look, the first, the first session we did, he walked in with a big folder of charts, right? <laughs> and I was like, oh, Nick. Put that away. <laughs> <laughs> the funk is not going to be in the charts. Yeah, That's how no, I tell them. The funk charts. ain't going to be in the charts. You can't yeah. write the funk down. You yeah. can't write the funk down, you know? Yeah. So he was like, oh, okay, so how do you want to do it? So he watched the, we would watch a scene, and Nick would tell me kind of what the vibe is, what they're looking for, and then we would just go. And I would be like, okay, try this bass line. Boom, boom, boom. Guitar, do this. Boom, boom, And we'll be in the moment with it. Then he jumped right in with us. He was right in there. You know what I mean? So it, it was definitely something a different way of approaching it than he's normally used to. All right, Rob. I want to play a couple of tracks you've written for the series and have you dissect what's going on. <laughs> okay. The name of the song is Westhead is Spaced, where Westhead is spacing out before the game against his old head coach, Jack McKinney. <laughs> Oh, yeah. That was one we came up with off the top. Okay. That's one of the ones where I just kind of start playing. I'll mess around in the keyboard for a second, maybe a minute, and then I say, okay, y'all, I'll start off, y'all fall in, and the horns, y'all kind of play some bluesy, lush kind of lines, you know what I mean, to give it the vibe, and then, you know, the horns, y'all kind of go back and forth with it, crossing over each other, you know what I mean? Do you have any other favorite tracks or songs 
There's one on season two. It's super high energy where they're playing. They're, they're on the basketball court, and we were playing some jazz stuff. It was just like the bass was going really fast. The drums were playing fast. And I had my friend uh, Kenneth Whalen playing saxophone. You know, it was like really out of control, and it was crazy. We did it for like 10 minutes. So, Rob, you worked in season one with Nicholas Bratell, and on season two, you work with Jeff Beal. There is an album being released, uh, which I'm hoping drops on vinyl as well, called The Winning Time Sessions. But all of your yes. great work on the show. How do you feel about this coming out? I feel honored, man. This is a this is a groundbreaking show. You know what I mean? And it's highlighting a very important time in sports history and just history in general. And for me to be able to do the score with Nick and Jeff was amazing. And also to actually put that out as an album is even more amazing, you know what I mean, to actually have that. Because so many people really love the score. They really love the music, yeah. you know? Well, it's great. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to have that out on, 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 and I hope it's on vinyl as well. I really hope it's on yes. vinyl as well. Yes, I've been begging. I've been begging. So, Rob, the name of this album is The Winning Time Sessions. Is that yes. inspired by anything in particular? Because you had the Blue Note Sessions. So there yeah. are Blue Note Sessions, yes, there yeah. are. There are. And it, it, it is kind of... Um, Kind of like when uh, Miles Davis did the, uh, he did a bunch of different sessions and called them the cooking sessions, relaxing, <laughs> and uh, an another one. But he did different different albums for that thing, and he called them different things. But sessions is in there. There's a lot of the word sessions when it comes to jazz albums and stuff like that. But, but yeah, but that it was for us. It was just like, oh, these are the winning time sessions because these were the recording sessions we did for winning time. And like I said before, it was so fun because. We literally play basketball in between takes. That's literally what we... Nerf basketball. Nerf basketball. <laughs> yeah. The, the degree of difficulty with Nerf basketball is a little different than with a real one. And how we did it, we had to tape the, the goal sometimes to a mic stand <laughs> and, like, all kinds of stuff just to, get it, just to get it right. You know what I mean? So, But that goes to show you, like, getting the spirit of these songs to really match what's going on on the screen... You got to do what you got to do. And that, that yeah. having that nerve basketball there, that fake little plastic goal, really helped bring us there. You know what I mean? I want to thank my friend, my friend, I hope you heard that, Robert Glass. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for all of the great music and the great Absolutely. spirits and everything. Your energy yes, comes indeed. through. Um, all of the guys that you work with, all of it comes through and makes winning time what it is. So... Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much. It's time for the buzzer beater. Today I'm joined by the head of the Winning Time Hair Department, Sana Sepinen. Hi, Rodney. Who made sure there wasn't a single hair out of place. Thank you, Sana, for coming to Winning Time and for talking to me. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been such a pleasure. So when you came onto the show, we had styles of hair from the late 70s, and now we're into the 80s for season two. How much of a shift was it from one to the other? From the 70s going into the 80s, it was, it was a pretty substantial shift, especially for a few of the characters. Like Jeannie Buss went from brown hair to blonde. We went from shorter to much longer hair. For magic, it became a lot neater, more sculpted, much more defined. The same for most of the basketball players, you know, they really went from a much more natural, round afro to something that was a little more styled, a little more sculpted, that started to show a bit more individuality. And then for the rest of the cast as well, we we just kind of 80s up their hair. So that was more volume, a little more curl, much different styling techniques. Hair from the 70s was much more natural. Haircuts were not as precise. Between the 70s and the 80s, Vidal Sassoon really had started to teach hairdressers how to cut for face shape. And we start to see a lot of that happen in the 80s where there's much more structure in the haircut. Men, you bring out more of the jawline, more cheekbones, Men's haircuts became more masculine instead of being so shaggy and feminine. And then, of course, we had the influence of all the 80s music and 80s icons that created this 
over the top styled in more dramatic color and in more uh, serious techniques of curling. And, you know, in the African-American culture, there was, you know, the barbershops were really starting to Mm -hmm. implement new style and design with the shaved sides and lines Mm -hmm. cut in the hair. What's the research process like? Like, how do you go back and see what was what? The research process to me is the most exciting part because you get to revisit history. It's a it's a new history lesson and you get to revisit what was current and what was happening. So apart from, you know, if you try to look up 1970s hairstyles on Google now, you just end up with a lot of, you know, millennials trying to do 70s. And so <laughs> I would typically try to find the class photos and, and the, the annuals, the school annuals with all of the images that are taken throughout the school year. So you can really see what kids looked like in that right. decade or in that year. Real people. Real people, exactly. And news stories and anything that would bring about a more authentic version of what people really looked like. What would you say the ratio from wig to people using their real hair, what would you say the ratio was from one to the other? Sort of, I think, in about the 15 percentile, because we had a lot of people who, a lot of characters that would pop in, you know, like a lot of the players didn't want to give up their lined edges and their fades. So on the court, that was, Mm -hmm. maybe we had two people who could grow their hair out, out of the 30 or 40 that were on that day. One of the things before we started this process, I never took into consideration, but happen to see really early on in the process is how difficult it is to deal with sweat and wigs when it comes to basketball players. Well, I knew that it was going to be difficult, but I didn't realize how difficult. I definitely yeah. did not get the scope of what I was getting okay. myself okay, into. Okay. <laughs> that was a shock. Yeah, those boys, man, they run and they sweat, they sweat. Those guys work so hard and they can sweat anything off. By the end of the day, we used our most concentrated efforts. And by the end of the day, we literally just pop them off like a little baseball hat. You would see teams of hair people coming in, taping down, taping down, getting it back on. And it was just a process, just a process. It was a process and a phenomenal amount of work chasing all of those guys around the basketball court. (laughs) All right, so (laughs) I'm going to ask you about a few of our characters and what comes to mind in regards to their hairstyle. All right, so Larry Bird, played by the great Sean Patrick Small, what does that conjure when you think of his hair? He's like one of those asshole 70s cool dudes. (laughs) (laughs) Jerry Buss, the great John C. Riley. Jerry Buss is the Mac Daddy. He can do whatever he wants with that hair, and it's going to work for him. Jerry West, played by the great Jason Clark. Let's see, his hair is so conservative office. <laughs> you know what? I hate to say it. It's, it's almost the hair of a dentist. It's just a okay, side party. All right. <laughs> I can see it. Paul Westhead, played by the great Jason Siegel. Well, Paul West had, I mean, he's just nothing but theatrical with that extra long floppy hair in the back. It's almost Shakespearean in its style and shape. Jeannie Buss, played by Hadley Robinson. Well, she went from very conservative and a little bit demure to quite glamorous. Honey Kaplan, played by Ari Graynor. Honey's hairstyle was really based on a cool, suave, 70s, sexy vibe. Claire Rothman, played by Gabby Hoffman. And Claire was all business. That was all business yep. hair. Sana, thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope we get to talk again. I hope we get to talk in season three. Thank you for your spirit. My and pleasure. Your dedication and devotion. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, my pleasure, Rodney. It's been great. Thanks for listening to the official Winning Time podcast. A special thank you to our guests, author Jeff Perlman, composer Robert Glasper, and hair designer Sana Sepinen. Next week, we'll be back to talk about episode five and whether Magic or Westhead ends up on top. New episodes of the podcast come out every Sunday night after the latest episode of Winning Time, which airs on HBO. Make sure to subscribe wherever you find your podcast so you never miss an episode. I'm Rodney Barnes, and I look forward to seeing you next week.
The official Winning Time podcast is a production of HBO, Hyper Object Industries, and Pineapple Street Studios. Our producers are Bria Mariette, Noah Camuso, and Elliot Adler. Darby Maloney is our editor. Our engineers are Harry Nelson, Davey Sumner, and Jason Richards. Our executive producers at Hyper Object Industries are Harry Nelson and Claire Slaughter, with production support from Zaley Mahoney. Our executive producers from Pineapple Street Studios are Gabrielle Lewis and Barry Finkel. Our production music is courtesy of HBO. Special thanks to Michael Gluckstadt and Savon Slater at HBO Podcasts.